<laughs> All right. All right. Well, we're live. We have somebody on, a few people on. So good to see everyone here. It's a little gray and windy and we had a few drops of rain earlier, but I don't, hopefully it won't rain anymore. But the wind switches direction every two minutes, so everybody's getting smoked out. The prayer request tonight, uh, remember us, he's, uh, he would have been here, but he's still suffering from this Ball's palsy and possibly shingles as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, what it is going on with him, but um, pray for him and he'll recover quickly and get over all of that get back to uh, the fellowship, doing the things he wants to do. I know he wants to get back on his boat, but he can't get back on his boat until he kind of gets over this. So, um, this is the wedding, just the plans, people traveling, coming in. The girls are coming in tomorrow night, our girls. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have to drive to Philly tomorrow and pick them up at 10.30 at night, which is way after me and Susie's bedtime. So we'll have to see how that goes. I have to take a nap before I go up there, maybe. We pick up a collection so they can Uber home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, an Uber would only cost a couple hundred dollars a piece, probably. Of course, it will probably cost me a couple hundred dollars to drive up there all the tolls no not that much but yeah the wedding is uh coming and pray for everybody involved um as susie said all the people that are traveling and joanna and roy you know it's a lot of a lot of things going on joanna's getting nervous and uh is she yeah. i need to get a hold of her she can't do that sure everything's gonna be fine but <laughs> Oh, really? Who has back pain? Marilyn. Don't she? Must be something about this church right. that causes back pain because everybody's suffering from back pain. Roy's got back pain. Well, and uh, Donna, continue to pray for her and uh, Diane. Um, Wendy, she's not doing it. She's having a hard time sleeping. All right, Wendy. How you doing, Carol? All right? Okay. Well, no. mm -hmm. All right. Well, we won't belabor that. Pray, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this night. Thank you that you gave us a respite from the rain and the weather. And uh, we're thankful for these people that came out tonight. We, or we think of those who are not able to come for whatever reason. Pray that your hand would be with them, that you would comfort them, strengthen them in whatever situation they're in. We pray for um, all the members of our church that are dealing with various challenges. Um, some of them, I, I should have mentioned one in particular, where, uh, but I really can't even describe it, Lord, without uh, talking about things that uh, really they don't want uh, shared. But uh, one of the men in our church, and, um, a personal matter with his uh, wife and so forth, that um, is just uh, really needs your prayer and your covering there, your deliverance. Um, we think of Lewis, who has been suffering from Bell's palsy and shingles or something to that effect, and uh, seems to be getting a little better, but we're praying, Lord, for complete recovery within the next day or so from that, that he would be able to join us for um, the various things that we're doing at the church, and uh, that he would be able to get back to his regular activities and work on his boat and so forth. Um, so we just pray for healing there. We pray for our uh, my son's wedding. 
and Johanna's wedding this um, Saturday. We pray that your hand would be upon all the moving parts there, Lord, all the people coming in from all over the country, and my daughter's coming in tomorrow, and Joanna's family all coming in over the next couple of days, and um, some people are already arriving, and uh, we just pray for everything to be worked out, that you would give Roy and Joanna a sense of comfort and assurance and, and a blessing that they know that you're with them, and that uh, they're comforted by all of this, that the stress doesn't get to them, that the... Um, all the uh, busyness doesn't uh, wear them out or uh, stress them out. And uh, we just look forward to a great time and a great celebration together with families and friends. And uh, we just pray that you'd watch over all those things, especially, Lord, the weather uh, Friday night and also Saturday during the wedding and afterwards. Um, we pray for Marilyn who's suffering from back pain, Lord. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but you know exactly. And we just pray that your hand would be upon her, that she might be given relief and deliverance from that. And Lord, we think of so many people that we know in our church who are suffering from something like back pain or leg pain or knees pain or uh, sciatic nerve or um, all kinds of different things like that. Uh, and I'm not saying that hopefully in a way that makes it sound belittling to those. I know it can be debilitating and it has been for many people in our church. And uh, we just pray that your hand would be upon them. We think of Donna, Diane, and Wendy, Marilyn, and others, Lord, that you know who they are. We think of Rusty and Pam as they're traveling and uh, others in our church who are traveling as well. And uh, we just pray that your hand would be upon them, watch over them, and all that they do. Lord, be with us in this study tonight. Help us to understand the Word of God, and may it speak to us, and may we learn from it and apply it to our lives. That it would not just go in one ear and out the other. We'd be doers of the Word and not just hearers of the Word. Now, Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And uh, we're only going to do the first seven verses tonight and see if that may be quicker or hopefully maybe it doesn't take as long, but knowing me, it'll probably take just as long. Um, I'm going to read the first seven verses and then we'll we'll go back through and talk about them. But I do want you to get a sense of the uh, sense of the uh, text. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness or vanity. Rather, fear God. Where the soot is flying everywhere and getting all over me. And uh, anyhow, this this passage is very timely for me. It's, it's something I've been thinking of uh, a lot over the last week or so, and uh, without even really realizing that this text was uh, 
that we were going to be looking at this week was going to be discussing some of the very same things I've been thinking about. Um, as a way of introducing uh, what Solomon is referring to here, I would remind you of a uh, an account in Second Samuel chapter six, verse one. And you'll remember that it, when I tell you about it, that it tells the story of David's efforts to move the Ark of the Covenant from Baal Judah to Jerusalem. And that was a journey of about 10 miles. And it was done with all good intent. The Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be in the temple. It was supposed to be in Jerusalem. It had been there due to a long chain of events. I'm not going to go all into it. And they have placed it on a new ox-drawn wagon and a procession numbering in of the thousands of people accompanied this wagon as it was moving the Ark of the Covenant. And they were praising God and they were singing and praising God as they transported this covenant, Ark of the Covenant. David, the king, is leading the head of the procession and he's praising God because he's recognizing that he's able to do this great thing, which is to return the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And uh, about halfway through their trip, or some point on their trip, the wagon hits a pothole and the Ark of the Covenant shifts on the wagon and appears that it's going to slide off the wagon. And uh, one of the men named Uzzah reached up and placed his hand against the ark to keep it from falling off the wagon. And God struck Uzzah dead. And David became very upset about that. And everybody became very upset about it. And we, in reading that, more than likely became upset as well when we thought, why in the world would God strike a man dead who was sincerely trying to help the situation? To keep, he was reverence, reverencing the Ark of the Covenant. He didn't want to see it topple to the ground. Why would God do that? It says in 2 Samuel 6, 7, the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah. And God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died by the ark of God. A more careful reading, though, of the scriptures prior to this event. Uh, in fact, generations before. God had told Moses that the ark of the covenant was only to be transported by using these specially prepared poles that went through these hoops on the Ark of the Covenant. It was to be carried. No one was to ever touch it. And if it was carried by those poles, it was only to be carried by um, the sons of Korah, Kohath. And they were responsible for carrying that ark on their shoulders by these poles. And no one was to ever touch it. And God had been very clear about that. So the fact of the matter is when David and Uzzah and these other men placed the Ark of the Covenant on the ark, on this wagon, they were defying God's law and God's word in order to worship God and serve God according to what they thought was appropriate, not according to what God had said. And so God was justified in striking Uzzah dead because he had told them that that was what would happen if anyone was to touch the Ark of the Covenant. It was to be holy, and God was holy and they were to treat it with the greatest reverence. Uzzah was basically, in God's eyes, unclean and was not able to 
uh, touched the Ark of the Covenant, and God had a responsibility to act. It was an affront to God's character to act against or in opposition to his word. And while that may not seem fair to David and Uzzah and others there, uh, and it may not seem fair to us, it is perfectly fair to God who has the right and authority to make laws concerning his Ark of the Covenant, his worship ceremonies, his prescribed manner of coming before his presence. And, and we are under the obligation to do as God has said. One of the problems that we have is we tend to think very little of the holiness of God. We may sing holy, holy, holy. We may uh, mouth those words, but do we really think about the holiness of God? And the, do we have the proper kind of reverence for him? In fact, if you take do a word study of the fear of the Lord, You'll find, I don't know how many hundreds of times that it is mentioned in the Bible, but I'm sure it's hundreds of times. And yet it's something that as Christians, we try to mitigate as much as we possibly can by explaining away what it, the fear of God really means and how we should really fear the Lord. You know, I forget who I was talking about the other day, talking with the other day. It may have been my wife. It may have been Rick. I don't know who it was now. But I, I said, sometimes I think I feel like I have a, a, a unsettled fear that maybe we're missing a lot of things that God would have us know and do. And yet we, they're not even on our radar. We, we've just excused that or blown that off. Maybe it's in scripture repeatedly, but, but we don't think it really pertinent to us. And we've just excused it and we've just um, uh, pushed it on the back burner and we don't even think about it. It reminds me of when um, God says in the scriptures over and over again that there was some new king that came on the throne, whether it was uh, Judah or whether it was uh, Israel. It, it didn't really seem to matter. And and he said this king was he did evil in the sight of God. And then the next king would come along and he would say, this king did good in the sight of God, but he would always categorize it by saying, but he did not ever, uh, he still worshiped on the high places. He still kept the high places there as, as places of worship and so forth, which was an affront to God. They weren't supposed to have those worship centers in the high places, which were really left over from pagan kind of uh, uh, rituals and ceremonies, and they had incorporated them. But the Israelites didn't think that was such a big deal because they thought they were worshiping God. But God had said, you shall not worship anywhere but in, but in the temple. You shall not worship in these high places under every luxurious tree or whatever. You're not supposed to do that. And yet they had done it for so long. It was part of the tradition. They never thought about it. The point of all that is, is that God is very specific particularly more so in the Old Testament than in the New Testament, but he's very specific about how he is to be approached and how is he to be worshipped. And, and, uh, and I don't think that the New Testament necessarily did away with every uh, aspect of how we are to worship the Lord in, holy, in holiness and in fear. You know, Peter made it very clear, you shall be holy even as I am holy. It was a quote from the Old Testament. So it is pertinent for the New Testament church. And so this is what Solomon is really getting at here, I think, is he's talking about our worship. But the problem is that uh, the worship of the church today is something that is sorely lacking in biblical um, truthfulness. It's modern contemporary worship is designed to evoke an emotional response at best, or more than likely, it's designed to create 
an emotional experience. Uh, and that emotional experience or emotional response, while it may be genuine emotion and genuine feeling and, and a genuine experience, is not necessarily true to the Word of God. And so we have to be careful. And I think God struck down Uzzah. He also struck, struck, down, struck down the two priests, Susie. Um, were they the sons of um, Eli. Eli, who brought false fire into the worship? And I'm not going to go all into what false fire was, but uh, there was a good chance that they were actually intoxicated, that uh, God struck them down dead in the midst of their, uh, and they were priests performing their duties. Yeah, I can't recall. I know these two sons were not were, uh, struck down. He also struck down in the New Testament, in the very first church, in the very first, presumably weeks of the first church, Ananias and Sapphira, who came in and lied before the church and lied before the Holy Spirit and presented an offering. They were presenting an offering. They were presenting money to the church. And yet God struck them dead, not because they were insincere in what they did, or because it wasn't their money, but because they had lied about how much they were actually going to give and then how much they ended up giving. Um, all of that to say that our worship and all aspects of it uh, need to be uh, very carefully considered that they are that we are doing it as God would have us to do it. You know, Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's very important. In the truth is very important. The truth according to what God says we should do. And there's a lot that passes today for worship in the church that I think is actually in a terrible affront to God. I don't think God is anywhere in it and anywhere close to it. And yet... Um, we have this attitude that, well, if it's done sincerely and it's done with enough enthusiasm and, uh, and then, then God is uh, an emotion, then God is obligated to accept it. And God is not obligated to accept it. Remember back when Cain and Abel, God accepted uh, Abel's offering. He did not accept Cain's offering. Both came to worship the Lord. Both came to bring an offering, a sacrifice. And yet God accepted one and did not accept the other. God is not obligated to accept our worship, but we are obligated to worship God. And we're obligated to worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's why I do the things that we do in our church. I, it's not without careful thought. I'm not saying we're perfect by any means. I'm not saying that we're the only ones doing it right. But I will say this, that as the, the longer I've been in ministry, the more concerned I've been that we do it as God would have us do it. That offering up any old false fire or any type of fire for that matter isn't, isn't acceptable in God's sight. And we need to be very, very careful about it. And I would rather do less than to do more. I would rather do less than to do more. And, 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 and Solomon says that exact same thing. Let me get to it. He basically says it, gives us four statements about how we are to approach God in worship. Four commands. And he, he references the first one is the feet, then the ears, then the heart, and then the fourth one, the mouth. The first one, he says, watch your step. Solomon says, guard your steps as you go into the house of God. The house of God was referred to the temple in most cases. The center of worship, it was where the Holy of Holies was, and God's presence was actually there, physically there. Uh, and Solomon tells his readers here to guard their steps as they enter into that presence. Uh, now, obviously, he's not referring to their physical steps. He's referring to their spiritual steps. Though there could be some physical aspects to the conduct of their life 
as a as a reference when he when the Bible says walk after the Lord or walk in the Spirit or walk according to His law or whatever. It's talking about a physical obedience. So uh, spiritual and physical, you know, perhaps aren't that far apart when he's talking about the steps. But the overall conduct of their life. Uh, in other words, he's focusing on the spiritual preparation that is necessary before going to uh, the house of the Lord, before going to present yourself to the Lord in worship. Uh, you know, as David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Um, you, you've got to uh, prepare your heart before you go in there because uh, you've got to recognize that this is a holy God and have the proper reverence for him and not just, uh, you know, there used to be this song is still out there, I guess. Shall I dance in your presence? You know, when I get to see the Lord, are we going to dance in your presence? Are we going to fall down? What are we going to do? I guarantee you're not going to be dancing. I guarantee you that. Not at the beginning. Um, you're going to be flat on your face before God. Look for any reference in Scripture where someone came into the presence of God, whether the angel of God or, or the glory of God in some way, and the first thing they did was they were flat on their face and they weren't able to be moved unless God strengthened them enough to raise them up. Um, I believe that's going to be our first response when we see the Lord. And there should not be uh, much less of that sort of reverence displayed when we ap approach God now. He says, guard your steps. Be careful of the way you approach the Lord. Um, you know, one, one thing I think that we're guilty of is we gather together on Sunday morning, on the Lord's Day, thinking of 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 our own needs and our own uh, agenda more than we think about the Lord Himself. Um, even to the to the point, and I don't mean to step on toes here, but I'm just going to lay it out and you can deal with it the way you want to do it. That's the rest. If you want to know why I don't, well, don't make a big deal about Mother's Day or Father's Day. Mother's Day is coming up, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna treat my wife on Mother's Day. I'll take her out to dinner. I'll do all these things. But on the Lord's Day, when I come before the Lord, on the Lord's Day, I'm gonna come before Him to honor Him. I'm not concerned about Mother's Day at that point. I'm not concerned that it's St. Patrick's Day or that it's whatever day. I'm concerned about that it's the Lord's day and we're going to worship him. And that's what my focus is going to be above all else, above all else. And I think we need to really be careful about that. Um, you know, a lot of people think that worship is, is kind of like eating at a fast food restaurant. You know, we just order whatever tastes good, whatever goes down easy and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's just supposed to satisfy our, our craving for, uh, a certain amount of spiritual food. And, and if that food is all whipped cream and ice cream and cherries, then, then that's, then that, the, 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 we're happy with that. But God isn't happy with that. I talked about this, uh, last week. I think I mentioned, made mention of the fact that the word of God is our spiritual food. And we need spiritual food more than we need uh, spiritual dessert. We need, we need the meat of the word that is going to sustain us through the week, that is going to give us the, the strength to be able to do the things that we have to do, uh, to endure the things that we have to endure. Um, Charles Spurgeon is quoted as saying, the unthinking Many, or I will rephrase it this way because he has a flowery way of speaking. Unthinkable, unthinking people many times imagine it to be a very easy matter to approach the Most High. And when professedly engaged in his worship, they have no questionings of heart as to their fitness for it. But truly humbled souls often shrink under a sense of utter unworthiness. In other words, he's talking about humility and having the right attitude of humility. 
So watch your step, guard your step. Secondly, listen up. Solomon says, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. He, he spoke first about the feet, guard your feet. Now he says, listen, he's talking about your ears. Drawing near to listen assumes that someone else is speaking, not you are speaking. In the house of God, it was designed not merely for a place of experiences or expressing, but it was the place where God spoke, particularly through the reading of his law and his word by his priest. Thus, Solomon pictures the person coming before the presence of God is one coming to hear the reading of God's word. And so for our position as worshipers, we should listen before attending to anything else. And so what he's getting at here is there should be a priority in our worship. And the priority is we listen before we necessarily start to respond. Uh, doesn't mean, we, that I'm not necessarily talking about the order of service, but I'm talking about the, um, uh, the priority of service, that our priority is to listen before we begin to think of our response. Have you ever had that kind of conversation? You, you're in a conversation with somebody and and you recognize that you're not really listening to what they say. Instead, you're thinking about what you're going to say back. Well, that's exactly what he calls a fool here, a sacrifice of fool, that uh, they don't know that they're doing evil because they're, they're coming into the house of the Lord and they're speaking before, they're, uh, before they listen, before they listen to God. They have a whole bunch they want to say. Um, so there's a priority of listening rather than responding. So his word, his word is the foundation for our worship. And his word is also the rule of our worship and the form of our worship. Here's another quote by a theologian who wrote uh, Systematic Theology. He said, it is obvious that we can have no rational feelings of gratitude, love, adoration, and fear toward God, except in view of the truths revealed concerning him and his word. We can have no love or devotion to Christ, except so far as the manifestation of his character and work is accepted by us as true. We can have no faith except as founded on some revealed promise of God, no resignation or submission except in view of the wisdom and love of God and of his universal providence as revealed in Scripture, no joyful anticipation of future blessedness which is not founded on what the gospel makes known of a future state of, exist of existence. So our, every every foundation, every uh Every aspect of our of our worship is has to be founded upon the word of God in order for it to be true. When Jesus said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, the only source for truth is the word of God. So we have to first consult the word of God to find out what the character of God is. So if we know for true, for we know the truth about God's character, then we're able to worship God's character. But it's pointless for you to try to worship God's character, which is a figment of your imagination and is not founded upon the word of God. And I'll tell you, and I've said it a million times before, a figment of our imagination is that God is a God of love and he's not a God of anything else but love. Yes, God is a God of love, but he is also a God of justice. He's a God of holiness. He's a God of righteousness. And we have to recognize the full counsel of the word of God and the full character of God. You're not one dimensional, are you? 
you're not a one dimensional person. You don't want, if, if I describe Susie Harrell in one word, can't do it. And it would be a really an affront to you if I tried to, if I said, well, you're a cookie cookie. Okay. That's my one word description of you because you know, she liked to cook. And so she makes cookie. Okay. That's my, that would be such a slight, that would be such a, 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 a an embarrassment to, to, to try to narrow you down to one word. And I think the same is, is even more true with God. We can't, we can't uh, condense him to one word. And then that is, is the full expression of who God is and what God is. When you have that kind of basis for your theology, then you end up worshiping something that is not God at all. He's not Jehovah God. He's some creation of your own imagination. And that's uh, certainly not going to be pleasing to God. So we need to have a teachable, receptive attitude where we listen and learn before we speak, before we respond. And that's what he was saying. But fools don't do that. They offer a, uh, a sacrifice of fools. They, they, they do not know that they're doing evil. Well, let me tell you something. You're driving down the road and you break the, some traffic law and the cop pulls you over and you say, Sir, I didn't know that I couldn't do this or that. I could, didn't know that. He's going to say ignorance of the laws of no, is no excuse. Simply because you didn't know you were doing evil doesn't mean you didn't do evil and you won't be punished for it. God is, holds us culpable for our ignorance because he's given us the word of God. We have a responsibility and a great privilege in the word of God to read it, to study it, to listen to it, and then to uh, respond to it. But listening to it is first before we respond. Then third, think before you speak. Think before you speak. So listen, but now think about it before you actually speak. He says, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Just, just listen to what he says there. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. You know, I thought we were just supposed to come to God with every little thing and just whatever crosses our mind or whatever. Well, Solomon's saying, actually, don't be hasty. Um, he wants us to meditate on the word, to ponder the word of God, and to ponder what our response should be before we uh, began to speak. Worship is not the place to speak of vain things, the silly things, sarcastic things. To It's not the place to for, for joking, for flippant words, for accusations, or even sarcasm. You know, in reading this, uh, I actually had to recognize that I'm guilty sometimes of sarcasm. And I, I remember Sunday I prayed and, and I, I made it. Diane had told me that they were having their anniversary and I wanted to say something about it. And I'd forgotten to mention it before I prayed. So as I prayed, I mentioned it. And then I said, but I don't know how many years They've been married, but judging from the looks of Randy, it's been a, many, many years or something like that. I was being sarcastic. I was trying to be funny. And I was doing it in my prayer. And at the time, I thought, well, it's okay. You know, it shows I'm, a, I'm not a, you know, uptight person. I'm trying to be cool or friendly or whatever. And, and I'm convicted that, you know, according to this study, that, you know, I really – don't want to be uh, guilty of sarcasm even in a uh, in in praying to the Lord. I don't want to be guilty of trying to make jokes at someone else's expense in praying to the Lord. It's not that the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor. I think the Lord does. I could make a joke about that, but I won't. But um, 
but I think that the Lord does have sense of humor, but, um, uh, but it's, I don't think it's in my, it's my place, especially in worship, corporate worship to use my position to, to, uh, be jesting, to be sarcastic, to make, to be flippant and all that sort of thing. And I think we need to be careful about it, you know, but yet if you go to most churches today and some preacher gets up there, I remember we used to have these evangelists come and, and, and I, as a kid growing up in the church, I judged the success of an evangelist by how funny he was. If he was funny and he kept everybody laughing the whole time, we thought that was the greatest thing ever, you know? And I remember those guys, they were funny. And they had everybody in stitches the whole time. Can't remember what they preached about, but I remember their jokes or the stories they told. Um, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that to, to a point, but I think Solomon's saying here, we really need to be careful about it. We really need to uh, think about what we're going to say and not be hasty, not be uh, flippant in what we say. Um, It's important that we appreciate God's holiness and his eternal nature. The fact that he is in heaven and we are on earth. That there is this great chasm between us. That he's inapproachable in, in, in any sense other than through the blood of Jesus Christ. It, he required a, a sacrifice that was unimaginable for us in order for us to be able to have access to him. in order to be able to approach him. And, and that sacrifice involved a gruesome death on the part of his son. Um, that should give us pause before we approach God with any kind of degree of, of uh, flippancy. Um, and I think it's true in the way that we pray as well. Um, Jesus taught his disciples to pray this way he said pray then in this way our father who is in heaven hallowed be your name you know I, I i incorporated that prayer in our service last sunday and i'm probably going to do it again not because i want to uh have everybody just say by rote the lord's prayer and you don't really think about it it's just a ceremony it's just part of a uh, liturgy that we go through and and it sounds holy or whatever. No, I, I want to actually think about the things that Jesus said we should pray for and how we should pray for them and what he said in that prayer and hallowed be your name. So much is, is, is inculcated in that phrase, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. And the holiness that we should uh, have towards the Lord when we come to him in prayer is not something that we should just brush aside and say, well, that's just, that's Old Testament. We don't have to be that way. We don't have to worry about that. We can come before him shucking and jiving and, and just having a grand old time. And, uh, and God will accept anything, you know, that we throw up there. Um, it's important when we pray that we think about what we're going to say. Um, you know, as I said Sunday, when I introduced the Lord's Prayer, there's a lot of things the Lord Jesus did not say in that prayer. There's a lot of things he did not say. And uh, and I'm not saying that we have to never pr pray about these things. But, but as I said earlier, I would rather do less than more. I would rather do less than more, than too much, than go too far. And, uh, and, and certainly God does not want us. Jesus said, uh, do not make long prayers like the uh, Pharisees do and who love to be heard for the length of their prayers and so forth. He says, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Um, but let your, uh, uh, he was saying, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I think one of the greatest uh, dangers there is in prayer 
especially in a corporate setting, is that we are praying for the benefit of others rather than for the benefit of God. And if we're praying to God and we're praying in humble, contrite heart with fear and trembling before the Lord God Almighty, and we're watching every word and we're guarding our steps and we're thinking about what we're going to say, then it's a wholly different prayer than if we're focused on their audience and what people are going to think about us, our prayer. I think a lot of people are afraid to pay, pray publicly because they, they think that they've, they've got to somehow put on a show or a speech or something. And, and you're not praying for people's uh, acceptance or people's uh, adoration or whatever. You're praying to be heard by the Lord. And you better be careful what you say to the Lord and how you say it. Because the Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows if you're praying to him or if he knows if you're praying to, to them. Who And so he knows that. And if we're really praying to the Lord, we need to be careful. Um, and make sure we do not uh, pray for public opinion. Those are the, uh, um, and then the, and, and right in that, uh, I, I kind of skipped over the one statement there in that verse. He says, therefore, let your words be few. For the dreams come through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. Let your words be few. That's what I was getting at when I kept saying, uh, I'd rather say less than not more. Um, you know, when Jesus, when he said, Pray in this way, and he, he led us through the Lord's Prayer. You look at that prayer, and it's very concise. I mean, each word is weighted so heavily and, and is so pregnant with meaning. Each word, each phrase. He didn't have to go, uh, you know, pray for, for 10 minutes and cover all of these different things. His, 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 his verbiage was so concise. Uh, and we're not going to be able to pray like the Lord Jesus prayed, but we can certainly have that as a standard that we're trying to strive for. Uh, but, and we can also apply the principle that let your words be few. And then he says, for the dream comes through much effort and the voice of the fool through many words. There's a lot of debate as to what exactly it means here, but, um, But in a sense, he's saying a dream here is uh, not revelatory dreams where you think God speaks to you through a dream. Not that, but vain imagination. That's really what he's referring to in our, as far as dreams, imaginations, things that um, we imagine about God. We imagine uh that aren't founded in the word of God. They're founded in our own imagination. And that, and just goes back to what I said earlier about how our whole view of God has to be founded in the word of God. It can't be, uh, God is not served by us sitting around a campfire and saying, what do you think God's like? What do you think God's like? What do you think God's like? And we come up with a consensus of what we think God must be like. And then we worship that. That isn't worshiping the God of the Bible. So that's our imagination. We need to instead look at, to see what God tells us through his revelation of the, in the word what he is like and then worship that God. That is the God that we're to worship. Um, the voice of a fool through many words. You know, um, I remember in school thinking, or being told somebody said it, whatever time, I forget. But perhaps it was kind of an adage at the time that, that the quietest person in the class was the smartest person. That wasn't always the truth. But it certainly was the perception, wasn't it? That the quietest kid in class was probably the smartest one. Because at least they appeared that way. It was a person that talked incessantly, was always babbling off and going off into something that was really... Uh, revealed what a fool they were in many cases. 
So having given us now these four instructions or commands for worship, he now turns to a particular aspect of worship, which is namely the making of vows to the Lord. Uh, a vow is a promise that is made to God for whatever reason, whatever purpose. You may have gone through some crisis in your life. I talked Sunday about foxhole Christianity where somebody back in World War II when they used to dig foxholes holes would be in there and the mortar shells were coming and, and, and they were thinking they were going to die at any moment and they call out to God and they make him all kinds of promises. And then when the battle's over, and they get a night on the town, uh, they, they've forgotten all about those vows they made to God. My dad used to call that foxhole Christianity. That, that's kind of the idea of, of making vows to God that you have really, you forget about once it's not convenient anymore, once the crisis is over. Um, you know, the Bible tells us, let, let our yes be yes and our nay be nay. And it's better, you're better off not making any vows to God than, uh, than making a vow and not keeping it. And that's exactly what he says. He says, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Now you can move, you can apply that to any situation you want, but if you made a promise to the Lord, um, you need to be careful to perform that promise. Uh, I understand we're not perfect and uh, our salvation is not based on us being perfect. I understand that. But God expects us to keep our vows. If we make a vow to God and we do not keep it, then you might expect God to... Um, to apply discipline to that situation, whatever the case might be. Um, I think that's what caused Ananias and Sapphira to be killed. And I always go so far as to say I think Ananias and Sapphira were saved. I think they were Christians. As far as we can tell, they were Christians in the church. And God struck them dead in the church because, in a, in a sense, they broke their vow to the Lord. They didn't think that God would require it of them. And I'm sorry to say that I'm probably guilty of that more than I realized. Of making a vow to the Lord, making a promise to the Lord, maybe subconsciously, maybe consciously. Maybe I made it 25 years ago and I've forgotten all about it. Maybe I made it two weeks ago and now I've forgotten about it because it's just not convenient to remind myself of it. And I've broken those vows, uh, broken those promises to God. Um, I would just urge you to, to, uh, to examine yourself. And if that's the case, then, then reach out to God and ask for his forgiveness and ask for his uh, mercy to cover you and, and uh, ask him to help you to fulfill your vow. Uh, because God keeps his promises. And he expects us to keep our promises. Second, do not let your speech cause you to sin and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Um, the messenger of God at that time may have been a temple official. In our day, messenger of God may be your pastor, may be a clergy member, but um, uh What's that? A donkey. Yeah, you're right about that. Um, he's saying basically here that, you know, hey, I made a mistake. You know, I, I knew a man once who said he was called to the ministry. And he went to Bible college and he graduated and he went out, went out to ministry and he uh, worked for years. And uh, took a salary and so forth, took a church and all this sort of thing. And then many years down the road, he said, I made a mistake. I should have never done this. I didn't 
don't believe I was ever called. I believe I should go do something else. And he said I made a mistake. I think that's a very, very dangerous thing to do as a minister, maybe especially, but in any capacity, I think it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, he says, why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? How would you interpret that? On account of your voice, on account of the things that you said, the kind of promises you made, God now is angry and he will destroy the work of your hands. Exactly what does that mean? Maybe your ministry, maybe your your livelihood, maybe your life. I don't know. Um, I've often said I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm bulletproof as long as I'm doing what God wants me to do. But when I'm no longer doing what God wants me to do, then God more than likely will take me. And uh, so I, you know, when you look at Peter, when you look at Paul, when you look at everyone in the Bible, uh, they were bulletproof until God was done with them. And when God was done with them, he took them. So uh, it, it's to my advantage to, to try to keep my promises to God and do what I believe God has called me to do. But you don't have to be a preacher for that to be true. You can, you can, that can be in any aspect of anyone's life. And then the last one is revere the Lord. He concludes with the final warning. For in many dreams and in many words there's emptiness or vanity. Rather, fear God. Um, the many words, the many dreams that he talked about earlier, it's all just emptiness. It's all just vanity. Fleetingness, emptiness, it's, you can't hold on to it. It's like a vapor. He's really talking about, you know, our worship of the Lord. If, if it's, if it's, if it's founded on these, these superficial uh, external things that we've conjured up, that we, we do out of our own enthusiasm or our own sense of emotion or, or whatever, and we, we throw them out there to the Lord or we engage in them even wholeheartedly even sincerely to the Lord, it's all vanity, it's all vapor unless it is founded upon the Word of God. And uh, you better make sure that it is because everybody can claim you know, the word of God to a certain extent. I mean, the Catholics are quoting the scripture. Every false prophet on TV is quoting scripture. Um, but are they really uh, interpreting scripture uh, properly? Um, rightly dividing the word of truth? That's something to be debated. But when it's coupled with a proper fear of the Lord, then you can be confident that God is uh, is accepting your worship and and that's what he ends with the to fear of the Lord um, fear God fear God is is to uh, is to revere God um, to have an awesome holy respect for God that uh, keeps us from presuming upon the grace of God that keeps us from presuming upon uh, God to be uh, tolerant of our independence of our willfulness of our um, our false fire that we offer up to the Lord our sacrifices of fools that we offer up to the Lord and think that somehow God is just going to be this big old roly-poly Santa Claus up in the sky that's going to accept everything and, and tolerate everything, and he just loves us, and he's just happy if we're praising him all the time. That's all he really wants us to do is just praise him, and he doesn't really care how we do it as long as we're just praising him. He doesn't care about anything else. That's a, that's a foolish, uh, blasphemous 
view of the Lord and uh, and of what our response to the Lord should be. So let's let's think about the uh, the way that we are to approach God and to guard our steps, to guard our mouth, let our words be few, to uh, ponder and meditate upon the Word of God, to listen first rather than speak, and then uh, hear the Lord. Fear the Lord more than we fear man. Keep our promises. Uh, keep your vows. Don't let your speech cause you to sin. Don't say you made a mistake. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And fear the Lord. All right, that's it. We're two minutes over. I knew we wouldn't finish early. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As convicting as it is, help us, Lord, to be good stewards of the grace that you have given us, of this salvation which we were given, which we didn't earn, which we didn't inherit, but you gave us through your grace, through your sovereign grace, and you appointed us. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards. Help us to uh, worship you in spirit and in truth as you would have us to worship you. And may it be a testimony to those who are seeking you, who are seeking to learn of you uh, as they watch our example, that we, are, we revere you, that we believe you are holy and you are deserving of our, of our worship and we are to serve you. And may they see the... Uh, humbleness of that and the uh, truthfulness of that and they res and may they respond to it not that we're doing it for to be uh, viewed necessarily by others outside of the church but um, but Lord uh, the church today is is a laughing stock I believe in the eyes of the world as they look at the escapades that are going on in a lot of these churches, particularly some of these mega churches and the um, free for alls that are going on and uh, everything from the music and the uh, antics by the pastors and the whole approach to worship is just so cavalier and so superficial and, and uh, how can they be um, convicted by that? Uh, how can they have any desire to be a part of that? So, Lord, I just pray that we would um, turn our hearts to you, listen to your word, study your word, and uh, rightly divide the word in truth, and that we might worship you, Lord, as you would have us to worship you. We know that worship is a whole lot more than uh, singing and clapping our hands, but Worship is is a is being obedient to obey. Jesus said is better than sacrifice. All right, Lord, thank you, and uh, watch over these people. We ask this in Jesus' name, Amen.